Now, I think we all know how the fandom feels about femboys in Warhammer. I didn't want to say this in front of Patrick. That hat makes you look like a girl. Am I a pretty girl? Oh, well, um, you're, you're beautiful. Uh, <laughs> but what if I told you there's one in canon? And shockingly, it's not a member of the Emperor's Children. And yeah, there was someone who, when I announced this topic, immediately guessed, oh, it's a member of the Third Legion. Nope. It's actually a Night Lord by the name of Gendor Scryvok, the canon femboy space marine. Now, is this because it's just me spitballing and just exaggerating, or could it be because the guy has either A, a big fluffy bed in his room, B, an actual simp, C, wears makeup, D, has a demon daddy sort of thing going on, E, is a fucking brat, F, gets punished by said demon like a discord kitten, or G, because he has an open mouth makeout session with the demon at the end of the book. It's a mystery by any accounts. However, it's not just the meme factor that's getting me to make this video. It's actually the fact that Gendor Scryvok, because of these things, is a really interesting glimpse into the functioning of the Night Lord's Legion come the end of the heresy. He is emblematic of the Legion's decline and what it had become, as well as why it had become what it was, this unruly bunch of murderers and torturers as opposed to what Conrad Kurz wanted it to be. He's actually a very poignant and interesting character. During the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy, Scryvok was actually a captain of the Night Lord's Legion and carried the nickname the Painted Count. The reason for this was because of not just his extravagant war paint, yeah, makeup, it's not like barbarian like tribal tattoos, it's white powder and then red eye makeup. It's makeup, like come on. But more importantly, it was also because of his noble ancestry. You see, when Conrad Kurz took control of his legion, he started remolding them with Nostroman stock, and what he wanted was the best of the best. The brightest stars Nostroma had to offer descended from their noble families. However, the noble families weren't too keen on giving up their sons, and as such, would start sending prisoners and other people in their place. Scryvok, however, was not one of them. He was genuinely noble. He came from the aristocratic Scryvok family on Nostromo, and this unfortunately showed in his demeanor, because he is punctuated by a level of arrogance and haughtiness that you wouldn't really see in other people, despite his not amazing combat skill. And funnily enough, it was Gendor Scryvok and people like him who were the architects of the Legion's downfall, despite the fact he's the exact kind of person Kurz wanted. Because Scryvok, unlike most Space Marines, would remain in contact with his family back on Nostromo, and with them, he would conspire to undermine the Night Haunter's authority. He would do this by having more criminals and dregs of society inducted into the Legion under Conrad's nose for the express purpose of generating a fighting force loyal to him so he could directly undermine Conrad's authority. That right there is really cool to me. Those Legionaries who had the balls to go against their Primarch and not just criticize them directly but defy them in general in such a brazen and far-reaching way is so interesting to me. Space Marines and other legions who didn't like their Primarchs or didn't go along with them would often just shut up and bear it. A good example of this was most of the Iron Warriors who had a very frosty relationship with Perturabo, but especially in Kaidamor Forex, one of the Trident, who had no love for Perturabo by the time the siege rolled around, yet still went along with his orders because it's what he is meant to do. Now, in this vein, I could point to other legions like Garvia Loken, Nathaniel Garrow, or Saul Tarvitz, all of whom I love dearly, but that's a bit of a different case, because they broke with their legion altogether for the sake of loyalty to the Emperor, which is awesome, but a bit different from characters like Gendor Scryvok, Erebus, Zardu Leic, and even Karn to a degree, who all either had rough relations with their Primarch and would actively defy them, or broke with their Primarch almost entirely yet still all remained loyal to their legions. That is really interesting to me because it shows a level of complexity and character motivation that we don't often see in other legionaries. And what was this motivation of his that caused him to directly shoot his legion in the foot for his own personal gain? It was just that. 
his own personal gain. He wanted power and influence, and he would get it at the expense of who the fuck ever. He would even go as far as to kill other legionaries when Conrad was missing in action in order to jockey for power. The dude was completely self-absorbed. Now, another interesting fact is his noble heritage, because we have to remember, the noble families of Nostromo were the ones who kept that planet in such a depressed and awful state. Their power was broken by Conrad Kurz. They all had to bend the knee to him, so it makes sense that his family would absolutely resent him, not just for having to give up their son, but because of their diminished position. And they would pass that along to him, and he would make it come to fruition with his gambit. If you ever wonder why Space Marines have to detach from their families completely, shit like this is the reason. That divided sense of loyalty that will test the Legion when it could stand it the least. And getting back to the femboy thing, he's just a complete brat in that regard. He takes things so personally. He holds things personally against his Primarch rather than throwing himself into his new life as a warrior. He just whines and pisses and moans for attention and to be important. It's something really interesting that, again, you just don't see in other legionaries. Just this all-too-human, bratty sense of entitlement. And another thing you never see with legionaries is his personal effects. Most legionaries have a very bare-bones existence. We can see this with Garviel Loken, who has very few things in his personal locker, including a rusted piece of wire that he muses no one would ever understand the meaning of, but is important to him because he strangled an Eldar Corsair with it that he personally really admired. And what does Scryvok have? He's got a giant fluffy bed in his room. Yeah, this is covered in one of the short stories that feature him as the main character. I can't remember if it's the one called A Safe and Shadowed Place or The Painted Count. Both of them very good, mind you. But he keeps it specifically because it is a vestige of his old life. It's something he could never get accustomed to without. He keeps it because he has that noble birth where he was used to being pampered and spoiled, and he never let go of that. He can't sleep on the hard mattresses that other legionaries have. So even though the bed is big and impractical, he has it stuffed into his quarters aboard his ship, the Umbral Prince. That is honestly just fucking hilarious to me. I like to imagine he's got a bunch of like stuffed toy bats or like a Ruby Gloom plushie on there or something. And when he's in that bed, he gets awoken by a knock on the door. By who other than his simp? Yeah, this guy has a literal simp. By that I mean, it is a legionary who has attached himself to Scryvok and takes it upon himself to effectively function as his equerry, and just generally do whatever he has to, to see that Scryvok's boots remain spit-polished. The reason for this is because this legionary, whose name unfortunately escapes me, is very weak. Scryvok comments on how he's lanky and scrawny and even paler than usual for a Nightlord, which is saying something. This is because he is one of those legionaries of the lower gene stock. He's some starved up drag who is either taken as a juvenile delinquent or probably some homeless orphan and just shoved into the legion. This guy probably has no business being a legionary, and yet here he is because of Scryvox meddling. So what legionaries like this would do in the Night Lords, since they couldn't really stand on their own effectively, is they would attach themselves to stronger legionaries and make themselves useful in order to gain themselves a level of assurance and safety as well as relevance within the legion, because the legion itself was not a merciful body. I guess the best way to think of it, even though I use the term simp, is more like a prison bitch, if anything. Which, yeah, does track into the character of the legion having been drawn from criminals and murderers. It's small things like this that show how the Night Lords really functioned on a day-to-day -day basis and just how run down the Legion had really become. Just how poorly maintained and screwed up they were even before the heresy and even past the torture. Whenever you talk about the Night Lords, the torture and the skinning of children sort of does take front and center and yeah, just not really a surprise there. But the Legion itself is very interesting in regards to how it was of such a lower quality than the other ones. When Scryvok later confronts a Blood Angel hero by the name of Ralderon on the walls during the Siege of Terra, he is told, You are a legion of torturers and murderers, and like all cruel men, you are cowards. Quick with your torturers' blades, but poor with your swords, before Ralderon proceeds to kick his shit in. 
but more on that later. Eventually though, Scryvok is able to, in his usual fashion, take control of the largest contingent of the Night Lord's Legion that is still looking for their Primarch. After Conrad Kurz went missing, this large group was led by a Marine named Shang, and Shang wanted to keep looking for Conrad because he was very close to him and very sentimental. Scryvok, however, did not give a shit. He pushed the idea that they should march on Terra with the rest of the Traitor Legions, and that if Kurz is anywhere and not dead, he would be heading towards Terra, something Scryvok knew was a lie and didn't care about anyway. But he said this so that he could present authority and push for power. Now, this was not wholly effective. This was generally met with people saying, hey, who died and put you in charge? Because Conrad certainly didn't. And his simp informs him that, oh, other people are starting to rebel against you and not listen to you. Oh, but not me, Lord Scryvok, never me, my god. So he goes out of his way to kill his biggest rival, Shang, and seize control of the Legion, thereby cementing his hold on power and pushing his authority on the Legion finally getting what he was always after. But how is he able to do this, especially since he himself is a generally not great fighter? Well, he does this through the patronage of a demon, namely a demon blade that will not leave him alone. He leaves it in the garbage compactor, it comes back. He leaves it on a planet, surprise it's there. He vents it out into the vacuum of space, whoop, turns around, it's sitting there in his room. But eventually he does relent because his rivals eventually toss him in the maze aboard their ship, the one that was used to hold Vulcan, in order to get rid of him. Now, how he gets out is when the sword appears to him, he uses it to cut through obstacles like nothing, eventually realizing just how amazing this blade is and finally embracing it, making him one of the few Night Lords to ever embrace chaos. But, being the little brat he is, he doesn't realize that no, this power is not his and is entirely borrowed, something that will very much come back to bite him in the ass. Scooting forward to the Siege of Terra, we see Scryvok, now fully in control of the largest intact Nightlord's contingent, making his way to the planet and scheming on how to best gain glory for himself and secure his position as the new head of the entire Nightlord's Legion. He does this with a really interesting gambit by getting the support of Karn the Betrayer. Now, you would reasonably ask, what does a sniveling coward like Scryvok have that Karn could want or admire? Well, it's the maze inside the ship, because they need something to contain Angron with. He is out of control at this point and not listening to anyone. If he's let loose on the ship, he will kill everyone and bring the Conqueror down before they even reach Terra's orbit. So a deal is struck between Scryvok and Karn, wherein Scryvok agrees to house Angron aboard his ship in exchange for the right to be first on the wall. A huge thing and something that will net him the glory and recognition he desires. However, make no mistake, he's not going to be leading that first assault from the front, no no no. See, he sends in his raptors first, specifically because he doesn't want his moment of glory to be marred by dying. Which, I mean, is fair, but at the same time, the dude is a massive puss. I love it. When on that wall, he starts cutting down blood angels left, right, and center like it's nothing. And it is due to that demon blade of his, something that he's come to truly admire. There, he finally comes face to face with Raldoran of the Blood Angels a hero of the Imperium, and that goes about as well for him as you might imagine. This is really best exhibited in an excerpt from the book The Lost and the Damned from the Siege of Terra, and this is what he is most known for in the fandom. Blood Angel! Scryvok yelled joyfully. Face me! The Blood Angel finished his opponent and turned to face the Night Lord. Upon his left pauldron, his name was emblazoned across a scroll plate just legible under rivulets of blood. Raldoran? said Scryvok. The Raldoran? He made a few passes with his sword, reveling in its lightness, in its killing edge. This will be a day to celebrate, the day I slew the hero of the Blood Angels! He saluted and proclaimed pompously. I am Gendor Scryvok, the Painted Count, Lord Commander of the Night Lord's Legion, and I am your end. The Blood Angel was unimpressed. Never heard of you, he said and came into attack, his power sword buzzing. Scryvok laughed and parried. 
the demon sword moved with a mind of its own to block the blow so fast, Raldoran was almost taken down by Scryvok's repose. Only a wild slicing deflection turned it aside. A second strike was thus deflected by Raldoran, and a third. The first captain of the Blood Angels was as good as his reputation suggested, but Scryvok was filled with sorcerous foreknowledge and supernatural speed. He saw an opening and moved in for the kill. He missed. He was too slow. Raldoran sidestepped the blow and twisted it aside with a single flick of his blade. Scryvok stepped back. The delicious feeling of power was gone. The world lost its sheen. He was in the rain, on the wall, surrounded by the dead, and he could not beat this man. Panic gripped Scryvok's gut. The blade was heavy. It would not respond as it had. Where before it accentuated his skills, lending him greater speed and strength, now it did nothing. Raldoran pressed his attack battering at Scryvok with a flurry of blows that he could barely deflect. The demon had deserted him. No, said Scryvok. It cannot be! Raldoran's power sword banged against the edge of Scryvok's blade, sending him stumbling backwards. This was always the problem with your legion, Night Lord, said Raldoran. You are quick with your torturer's knives, but so few of you are worthy warriors. Raldoran swung his sword over arm, building momentum into a blow that would cut a power-armored warrior in two. Scryvok parried it only just in time, stepping back and nearly tripping on the corpse of a Night Lord. Raldoran followed with another blow, and another. Scryvok struggled to stop him. He was so fast! Scryvok was a Space Marine captain, and more than a passable swordsman, but Raldoran was a hero of the Imperium, whose name was known across the galaxy. Raldoran attacked with greater ferocity. Scryvok's arm was numb from deflecting the blows. He forayed a few attacks, but they put him in more danger, as Raldoran caught and countered every one. His latest repose was turned away, and Raldoran's power blade scraped sparks up the side of his breastplate. Atrementar! Scryvok called, his panic rising. To me! If they heard, they could do nothing. They fought the Blood Angel's dreadnought still, their number reduced to three. Night Lords! Help me! His power pack scraped on Rockcrete. He had his back to the outer crenellations and could retreat no further. Raldoran faced him. His sword energy field buzzed in the downpour. Listen to you, Raldoran said. The masters of fear. You are cowards like all cruel men. Raldoran proceeds to basically beat the snot out of him up until the point he is clinging by his elbows to the wall for dear life while Raldoran looks over him smugly and then pulls out his bolt pistol ready to shoot him. And rather than be shot, Scryvok hurls himself over the wall. And he actually tried to surrender. He said to him, wait, no, I give up, I'm your prisoner, I give you my surrender, and Raldoran basically laughs in his fucking face. There are no prisoners in this war. How many times, honestly, have we seen a space marine begging for his life, screaming for help, and trying to surrender. That does not happen. And when he hurls himself from the wall, it is stated he reaches terminal velocity long before his body breaks upon the stones. And we do catch up with him by the end of the book. He is lying there, bleeding, choking on his own blood, crying, begging for the demon to return and save him because he is terrified of dying. He begs and pleads for his demon daddy to come back and return. And the reason I keep saying that honestly kind of gross way of putting it is because, well, you might need to just hear for yourselves. Because when Scryvok is there begging for his life and for the demon to return, it does. And he immediately starts panicking and telling it to go away. Do not be afraid. I am your sword. I am your demon. We spoke before on Sotha, you and I. We are important to one another. I don't know you. I have many forms and many names. You know me well and always have, as you shall soon see. The walls between our spheres are breached. I can be here now, thanks to my connection with you. Others of my kind will come soon enough, but not for you. I am the first and you are mine. He came to a halt at Scryvok's side and looked up at the continuing battle. Soon the anathema will fall, and this sphere of being will be like ours. It stared down at Scryvok with huge brown eyes that might have been beautiful in another creature, but in its lumpen face were abhorrent. Thick, clear fluid wept from them, dribbling on its long snout and coating its teeth. 
Now what do we do with you, I wonder? The Neverborn knelt over him and rested a knobbed hand upon Scravok's broken armor. Its fingers dabbled in his blood. Why did you leave me on the wall? Said Scryfok. Because I could, it said. Its voice was wet and labored. Because you needed a lesson. I made you strong, Scryfok, and you assumed that strength was your own. You are a traitor and a murderer. Ruthlessness and a little cunning are your only gifts. But you mistook my talents for yours. It snickered. Can you imagine? The painted count thought himself the equal of the first captain of the Blood Angels. A priceless error. I slew Lord Shang, croaked Scryvok. I slew Lord Shang, countered the demon. Not you. Truly, you are gloriously arrogant, it said with satisfaction. A befitting soul bond for me. We shall have such times, you and I. I am a captain of the Night Lords. You are, you are, the demon said, patting him. But you cheated your way to your command. You never had the patience or the discipline to properly master the gifts the anathema bestowed upon your mortal body. You are no warrior, Scryvok. You never were. You are a parasite. You are a gutter politician. You are devious and false. Nothing more. What do you want of me? Scryvok said. His life was ebbing away. Not long now. He almost welcomed it. You have a choice to make, it said with relish. You can die here, now, and your soul will flee into the warp, where it will be torn to pieces by my kin who dwell there. The alternative? His eyes were heavy. Blood dribbled into his lungs. The Neverborn leaned closer and whispered with rank breath into his ear. You can offer yourself to me, wholeheartedly, with no reservation or doubt, and I will take you into myself. You will become a part of me, and I will become a part of you. Together we shall live forever and tread freely the Materium and Immaterium both. We shall bring such pain upon this sphere of being that it will wound the very light of the stars. I will die otherwise, he said. You will do more than die. You will cease to be. Then yes, said Scryvok. Yes, anything but death. Anything, crooned the demon. Yes, said Scryvok. Fear sent the last jolt of energy into him. He lifted his head. Anything. Then say the words, growled the Neverborn. Okay, buckle up everybody, because this is where it starts getting really fucking horny. Its thin lips were close enough to kiss. The fluid from its eyes dribbled onto Scryvok's face. I pledge myself to you. I shall become yours, and you will be me, and I will be you. Is that right? Is that right? Please don't let me die. The demon chuckled. I chose you so well. Yes. Those words will suffice. This is your first lesson. The form of the words do not matter, only their sincerity. And I see that for the first time in your life, Gendor Scryvok, you are sincere. I am. I am. A long, reeking tongue slipped between the demon's lips, furred green and ulcerous, and pushed roughly into Scryvok's mouth. It slithered into its throat, growing longer and thicker, plunging down, down inside him, blocking off his air, choking him. The demon's mouth parted wider and wider. The tongue grew thicker, while the rest of the being deflated, pouring itself through the serpent of its tongue into the Night Lord. Scryvok goggled and choked, his eyes wide with terror. Did I mention, said the demon into his mind, for the mind was its now too, that for you to deliver pain correctly, you must learn what pain is. I will take you now, into the warp, where for six times, 666 years, you will learn the depths of agony. This is a great gift. No living being could survive the torments that await you, my friend, my soul bond, my painted count. But you will. You will become expert in pain. Scryvok's eyes bulged. The demon slithered inside him, pulling its empty skin after it. Scryvok's flesh growed lurid purple, too bright to look at. When the light went out, his armor was empty, but the demon was good to its word. 
The Painted Count was not dead. In the depths of the warp, Gendor Skrivok began to scream. I will not comment further aside from saying that this is the single most suspicious paragraph in all of Warhammer. Guy Haley, I want to see your browser history now. And I do believe all of you now see in its entirety where exactly the title of this video is coming from. Now, funnily enough, this actually isn't the end of him, because he does become a demon prince after that allotted time in the warp with the demon, and only takes the name of the Painted Count. Again, very, very rare for a Night Lord of all people. When we next see him, he is actually fighting against the Dark Angels and kills the previous Grand Master of the Legion, allowing Azariel to ascend, who subsequently banishes him. And his demon form is badass. He spreads his ribs open to reveal a gleaming gem in his body, which he pulls out that transforms into a demon sword. The Dark Angels are only really able to beat him and his host back because of the intervention of the Eldar of all people. It's really cool. Now, if there is one solitary complaint I could make about this character that, even though I really enjoy him, have to admit is kind of annoying to me, is his motivation. Not his motivation for destroying his legion, that's perfectly in line. It's his motivation for fighting against the Imperium itself that I find questionable and honestly just tacked on and out of place. Because in his internal dialogue, we find out that the reason he hates the Imperium to the degree he does is because he believes the Emperor could have redeemed the Legion at any time, but simply chose not to, or just didn't care. That comes out of nowhere. Why would he care about if the Legion is redeemed or not? He's completely selfish. If anything, he actively made it worse, but somehow now he cares? Now he holds it against the Emperor? Where does this come from? He is clearly sadistic in nature. He is clearly not even close to fucking honorable. He's not like Jago Sevatar or Felzarost. If there is anyone who would not give a shit about that sort of thing, it would be him. And yet we're sold this weird, tacked-on plotline that's mentioned once in his internal monologue? It just makes no sense to me. And honestly, it's part of the reason why I never cared for the Night Lords all that much to begin with because people keep trying to sell me on this big Greek tragedy when in reality, they're at their best when they're unrepentantly evil and have no desire to be good or any aspirations for anything truly better. They're amazing villains, so I don't know why people try to sell me on this, like, tragic sad boy thing going on. Gendor Skrivok is best as Starscream, not as any kind of potentially misunderstood character or having a legitimate grievance to begin with. It's just something annoying, and I honestly just actively choose to ignore it. Like, I'm fiddling with ideas for the Sanguine Heresy, which is basically the Horus Heresy led by Sanguinius, and is quite different from how things happen in canon. I actually do bring him up as a loyalist, but not for any good reason. He just breaks with the Night Lord's Legion to seek personal glory for himself and for those who will follow him as a loyalist because he believes that's the best way to distinguish himself and effectively gain some celebrity status in a way in the galaxy. So he leads a band called the Twilight Host and eventually comes to blows with other traitor Night Lords. But you'll have to finally wait for me to start actually writing things down instead of just swirling ideas in my head and see where I'm going with him because I do think it is kind of interesting what I have planned. So a really cool character if I'm being honest. And the fact that he does come back all those years later just makes him that much more interesting to me. Gendor Skrivok is, to my mind, a really good example of what I like to call an OC character. Now, of course, all these characters are OCs, but some characters definitely have the vibe of a character that was created by an author for fun so that they could play around with concepts as opposed to someone more relevant to the wider lore or more specifically designed to fit into the setting themselves. Some characters like this include Iskandar Kaon, Solomon Akura, and others. If you have any other examples, I'd love to hear about them because I find these characters really interesting. Now, all the books and short stories featuring him are written by Guy Haley, with the exception of Space Marine's Legion Azariel, which was written by Gav Thorpe. So, we really can see a through line of Guy Haley basically just having fun with this femboy Space Marine, and I'd say he did a damn good job. But what do you guys think? 
Do you guys enjoy characters like Gendor Scryvok? Do you agree with my assertion that he's a genuine femboy, or do you think I was just maybe clickbaiting a little bit? In any case, I would love to hear what you guys think in the comments below, and I will see you in the next video.